So, hello everyone, welcome to our symposium. My name is Andre Bormann, I'm a professor here at TUM, and I'm very honored to act as the interim director of the Geodynamic Institute. Um, today, I would like to take the opportunity to give you a brief introduction to this new to Geodynamic Institute, both in terms of its structure, but also its activities and its um, scientific mission. Um, first, um, this picture was taken when the Institute was officially founded on November 10 last year, really a great day for our university, but also for the society as a whole, I think. And I would like to thank Professor Georg Nemicek personally for his impressive donation that will help us to advance the technology in this important field. Let me now give a short overview on the structure of the new Geognometric Institute and its wider position in the environment here at UM. The core of uh, the GNI is formed by the chair of AI. Um, the chairholder is also the director of the Institute. The GNI has two boards, the Board of Trustees and the Scientific Advisory Board that I will explain in more detail in a second. In addition, we have the network of collaborative partners where scientists across the entire TUM will work on projects related to AI for the build world. The GNI is um, closely associated to the MDSI, the new Munich Data Science Institute, which addresses a wider field of data sciences. Um, it has the aspects of data management, domain specific data sciences, and foundations in data sciences and mainly focuses on digital medicine, digital earth and um, digital materials. On the other hand side, we have the already existing Leonard Wormeyer Center um, that focuses on digital methods for the built environment. It's composed of uh, the chairs architecture informatics, computation modeling and simulation, photogrammetry and remote sensing, geoinformatics and construction process management. Um, there will be strong connections between these institutes, both in terms of people, but also in terms of scientific projects. Now let's have a look on the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees is composed by a number of really renowned personalities. Um, Professor Wolfgang Hermann, the former president of TUM, is a member of the Board of Trustees. Then we have Professor Hans Strunk, who is the chairman of the board, and Professor Emeritus here at TUM. Um, professor Ian Smith is also um, Professor Emeritus at the EPF Al Lausanne, also a member of the Board of Trustees. Then we have Professor Daniel Hall from the ETH in Zurich, um, Dr. Angelika Kneidel, our CEO of the TUM startup Accurate, and Dr. Axel Kaufmann um, as a guest. Uh, from Nemetrek, he is spokesman of the executive board of the Nemetrek Group. The board of trustees has um, the task to oversee the activities of the GNI. It advises the Institute on all general scientific, organizational, and technical aspects. And most importantly, it approves the funding decisions for the interdisciplinary projects. Then we have as the second board, the scientific advisory board, which is composed of Professor Petzold from Architecture Informatics, Professor Stiller from Photogrammetry, Professor Wormut from Numerical Mathematics, Professor Chu um, of Data Science and Earth Observation, and Don Jacob, um, again as a guest, the representative of the Nemecher Group. Um, the Scientific Advisory Board is responsible for the scientific evaluation of the project proposals and uh, it is steering the review process. Um, then we have the general manager, Katharina Langosch, who joined us on April 1st and we are really happy about this. She is responsible for budget planning and reporting, management of all administrative aspects, the coordination of the funding programs and all internal and external communication. Then we come to the core of the Institute, the chair of AI for the built world. Um, the director of the Institute at the same time will be the chairholder. In the moment we have a search committee in process. 
searching for potential candidates for this position. Um, of course, the chair will have scientific staff. It will be associated with the School of Engineering and Design, which will be launched in October this year. And uh, of course, it will be involved in research and teaching activities. In addition, we are expecting that the chair will be quite successful in raising third party funds in this important area. Um, then we have the very important interdisciplinary research projects. Um, the, they play a really integral part of the Geoglimetric Institute. We have uh, in total 23.3 uh, million euro available over the next 10 years for that. Um, the projects are meant to foster the collaboration between scientists from different fields, from computer science and mathematics on the one hand side, and scientists from the build world on the other hand side, namely architecture, civil engineering, and geodesy. Um, these scientists are supposed to team up in teams of different sizes, starting from two principal investor investigators up to six uh, principal investigators, where we then have um, larger, larger projects. Um, funding decisions are based on competitive calls. So we will have one call per year. The first call we had uh, was out this uh, early this year and was due on February 15, where we received a number of very interesting proposals um, that are now undergoing the review process. And here you see this review process. Uh, we have a call, then the proposals are submitted. They are formally checked uh, for formal criteria, and then they are handed over to the scientific advisory board that um, sends them to external reviewers. And based on these reviews, um, the scientific advisory board will prepare a ranking of these projects based on these reviews. It's um, then handed over to the board of trustees who takes the final decisions regarding the funding. Okay, this was um, a short introduction to the structure and the activities of the um, Geoglimetric Institute. Now I would like to go also into the topics of the Institute. And to this end, I would like to give you a short introduction to AI. And I'm really sorry for all those AI experts that we have here today, who have, of course, a deep understanding of AI that my introduction will be rather short and superficial but I think it's good to get the broad audience on board. Um, AI definitely is a mega trend. Uh, most of the analysts say that AI is one of the most important technologies of the future, uh, including, for example, the analysts at Gardner, and I have brought along the hype cycle for immersion technologies uh, they have defined. And you see many of the technologies they see as promising are based on AI, like embedded AI, responsible AI, generative AI, composite AI, and so on and so forth. Um, there are promising applications in all kinds of um, domains. Um, however, what we also see is that more research and development is necessary to really bring uh, these technologies from the early phase of innovation to the plateau of productivity, where it is then beneficial for the society. Um, AI has many different subfields. That's also important to highlight. We have the more um, traditional forms of AI, um, which were called symbolic AI, where things like first order logic have been developed in expert systems. Um, more recent uh, approaches in this area um, uh, under the umbrella of machine learning. Again, we have different sub-technologies, including artificial neural networks, decision trees, support vector machines, Bayesian networks, and evol evolutionary algorithms. The most promising technology are artificial neural networks and a uh, technology called deep learning, which is based on artificial neural networks. And now I would like to have a closer look on that. So first, um, artificial neural networks, what is that? Well, they imitate the behavior of the human brain. Um, they consist of neurons, and essentially these neurons are, are connected to form a graph. Uh, in this graph, each neuron is connected to other nodes via links, and these links correspond to um, the 
biological axon synapse dendrite connections that we have in biological reality. Each link has a weight, and this weight is really important because it determines the strength of one node's influence on another, and these weights are adopted in the training process that I will explain later on. Um, now we come to a special form of these artificial neural networks, the so-called convoluted neural networks. Um, they are used for what we call deep learning. Um, for many applications, we need networks with a large number of uh, hidden layers. Um, they typically have then also 3D layers, so we don't have 1D layers anymore, but actually uh, 3D um, are um, the nodes are organized in three dimensions. Um, and we have so-called local connectivity. And for that um, operation, mathematical operation is important, so-called convolution that combines neighboring information. It's essentially a matrix operation where we have an input and we multiply that with the kernel and we receive an output where this neighboring information is uh, combined. These kind of operations can be used, for example, in um, image analysis, here we see how the convolution is applied and that it results in the so-called feature map where we see the edges in um, the figure, which then can be used for further analysis. Um, well, we have usually quite complex architectures in these convoluted neural networks where we have different layers with dedicated functionalities. And well, they can be used for many different um, um, problems, for example, in classification, where we would have this image as input, and we would have a classification output like car, track, van, and so on. Um, now I want to highlight also the training and the validation of how to make the neural networks work in the way we want them to work. Um, we um, need to train them, and to do so, we present a lot of data um, to the network where we know the correct output. Um, for example, if we want to use a network for classifying pictures for being cats or dogs, then we, we, present, we present to the network a lot of images containing um, um, cats and dogs. So each time a wrong classification is performed, these weights have to be adopted according to our predefined rules that I cannot explain in detail here. Um, we do that um, until we reach convergence, meaning that the network produces correct answers. Afterwards, we have to perform the validation uh, where we check that um, the uh, system works correctly and we check to which extent it works correctly. And this is important. We then use other data than what has been used for training. Then the neural world network can be applied in practical applications. And now I would like to give you some input or some insight into potential uh, example applications in our area here, the build world. Um, one of the application areas um, that is very promising is digitizing the six and the existing build infrastructure. What is the background? The background is that a large part of the infrastructure uh, is already existing in the developed world. Um, the challenge is that we do not have um, digital models or digital twins for the existing um, infrastructure, but we need it to be able to manage it. Um, this is a problem that have, has almost all developed countries around the world. So typically we apply uh, capturing technologies, laser scanning photogrammetry that result in point clouds, but the point, point clouds alone are not um, uh, valid for performing, um, for, for using them as a digital twin. So we need to uh, process these point clouds and generate a model, and we do that typically with AI-based methods. The different approaches, the approach that we have investigated is to use AI-based optimization methods um, for fitting um, highly parameterized building elements, uh, building components, like, for example, this uh, abutment wall to the uh, point cloud, which then will result in high level building information model that we can use for managing this infrastructure asset. 
Another source for digitizing the built infrastructure are technical drawings. For example, German railways has millions of drawings representing their railway infrastructure, but they can use this information only to a very limited extent because the drawings are not digitized. So we help them to lift this treasure, so to say, by applying AI technologies for uh, analyzing these drawings and detecting symbols, for example. These symbols are very important in uh, railway drawings and provide a rich source of information because they tell you exactly what kind of object is uh, installed at which location, like for example, a switch or uh, a signal. Now we can combine this information with another um, type of technology, AI technology that we see here. Here we analyze videos from a train driving along the, the railway. Um, we apply AI-based image recognition to detect equipment, um, but now in the video from the real world and not in the drawings. The tool that we see here was developed um, together with the industry partner Signon, who is now applying this in their daily business. Now, we can combine easily these two information sources, so one inside the drawings and on the other hand side the video analyzers, to check for the consistency between these two sources. If we find um, 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 yeah, dis distances or um, deviations, then we can update the digital twin um, of the um, railway facilities. Digital twin for the rail, again, very important for maintaining the large network uh, of a, a railway infrastructure. Coming back to the drawings, um, they also play a very important role in the design process and the subsequent handover of the design information. Today, we see more and more um, construction projects adopting novel methods like building information modeling, but at the same time, they use uh, what we call a hybrid handover, where they hand over to the client or uh, the construction company, both drawings and um, a 3D BIM model. So the challenge here is and it's very important to check the consistency of the 2D drawings and the 3D models. Again, we have um, used and applied AI technology. We have used shape descriptors to find the location and the orientation of the floor plan, for example, within the 3D model. We also use CNNs to segment 2D drawing elements and match them to the 3D building elements. Um, saying in the design phase, um, we see also a big trend in AI-based design assistance. So for example, if we design transportation hubs like uh, train stations or subway train stations, it's very important to analyze the pedestrian dynamics in this field. Um, normally, we would use conventional pedestrian dynamic simulators um, to assess the uh, streams of, of people. However, they are computationally quite expensive, um, which means it requires a lot of time to perform such a computation. We have then developed a CNN that um, delivers quite similar results in just a few milliseconds. So you can see uh, on the lower part here, we have on the one hand side the simulation, on the other hand side, uh, the CNN, and both results are almost the same. This enables then, of course, a real-time evaluation of different designs, uh, which allows us uh, to perform actually an interactive design of these uh, railway stations, which improves the design with respect to the pedestrian dynamics. Now we come from the design phase to the actual construction phase. And again, um, AI-based object detection can help us a lot, for example, to identify certain elements on the site, like, for example, formwork elements or specific building elements like the columns that you see here on the right-hand side. When we combine this with a 4D BIM model, we can then automatically assess the progress of the construction project. Um, again, this can not only be done from images, but also from videos, uh, like this one, which was taken from a drone. Here we detect 
our formwork elements in an interactive manner. And this can help us to, for example, identify potential hazards on the site, which can make construction sites safer, just as one of the potential applications. This is also very much related to our, our work related to site layout detection um, that we are performing on the basis of uh, photographs um, that are taken from airplanes or helicopters, aerial photographs. Um, here we have applied AI to detect construction sites, first of all, but then also get closer and identify the site layout by um, identifying cranes, building storage, build, the, the building to be constructed in, in the storage space. Um, we do that uh, to perform learning by example and identify typical patterns of site, site layouts, which then can help future site managers to do a proper uh, layout um, of their construction site. And finally, we come to, um, to the handover to the operation phase. Um, the problem here is this um, currently um, as designed models to often not reflect the as built reality. So there are deviations between design and as built. Um, what we do is we typically capture um, the uh, building in point clouds, photogrammetry laser scanning. Um, the goal now is to perform a semantic segmentation, as this is called, um, to identify precisely the uh, deviations and update uh, the BIM model accordingly. Uh, to this end, we must identify not only uh, the parts that are different, but also their semantics, uh, namely walls, piping systems, slabs, and stairs, and so on. Uh, in this study that has been conducted together with the ETH in Zurich and uh, Siemens, we use uh, meshed point clouds and they provide a very good input for so-called graph neural networks that we could uh, successfully apply in this study. Okay, so I'm almost at the end of my talk. Let me shortly uh, give you a summary. Uh, AI offers very promising approaches for applications in various fields of the board environment. The available methods are manifold, but also the, the challenges that we have in the build world. It's definitely a great field for research on multiple scales. Uh, but of course, we as researchers must be aware of the limitations. We always have to be um, yeah, kind of straight with the limitations. And we must be also be aware of the social implications. So that's the end of my talk. I thank you for listening and I look forward to a very interesting symposium.